Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. Ross sent me a note. So Steve, check this out. And it caught my eye because it's about the UCC Article 9. And now <laughs> a lot of people don't know what Article 9 is out of context. But it's a Uniform Commercial Code section on secured transactions. If you've ever bought a car where you went into a dealership and said, I'd like to buy a car, I haven't got the money. They said, oh, we'll get you a loan. You sign a bunch of papers and you leave the dealership in a vehicle and in debt. And the retail installment sales contract says you're going to make payments. But what you've entered into is called a purchase money security interest. Purchase money security interest. Somebody fronted the purchase money to you in exchange for a security interest in the vehicle you just bought. So they have the right to retake the collateral, the car, if you don't make payments. And all of this is governed by the UCC Article 9. So I had a case a few years ago that went up on appeal. It was an Article 9 case. And uh, for a few minutes, I was, I was an expert on it. I still remember most of it. But, but the funny part was that I had to get up in front of the Court of Appeals and make these arguments. And so this particular case, uh, the headline says, Nationwide UCC Article 9 Settlement on Car Repos, Repossessions of Cars. And this is extremely important because uh, cars get repossessed all the time, and the right to repossess a car is described in Article 9. Article 9 says if you are a lender and you repossess a car, there's certain things you must do. And if you don't do them, then you screw up and you can get in trouble. So here we go from Virginia's Lawyers Weekly. The headline is, Virginia attorney helps plaintiff earn landmark settlement, $360,000. And this is from Virginia Lawyers Weekly. The type of action is a consumer class action under the UCC for violation of post repossession notice of sale. So what happens is this. Let's suppose we take the hypothetical, prototypical situation. You buy a car, you're supposed to make payments on it. You stop making payments. You can't make them for whatever reason. One day you go outside, the car is gone. It got repoed, okay? And you get a notice in the mail that says your car has been repossessed. And it'll say then, here's what's going to happen. If you want the car back and you do so quickly, you can pay us some money to get it back, but you have to pay, number one, how you're in arrears, plus the towing and the repo charges and all that stuff. But you can get the car back and you can cure this. If you do not do that, the vehicle will then be taken to an auction and sold at auction. And whatever money is achieved through the auction will be applied against your loan balance. And if it pays off your loan balance, you're good. If there's a surplus, you'll get that. That never happens. So if there's a, a deficiency, then we'll come back after you for the deficiency. So let's suppose you owe them $20,000. The car sells for ten. dollars Well, they take the $10,000, apply it to the twenty, dollars and they go, you still owe us ten, dollars plus the cost of the auction and repossession. Blah, blah, blah. It gets ugly. But the law says they have to send those notices and they've got to do the math and lay it all out for you and explain all of these things along the way. So the injuries alleged here were statutory damages and being subjected to a deficiency balance claim and credit damage. As you can imagine, a repo on your credit report does bad things to your credit score. So this actually resolved through mediation and it was a settlement. So it didn't go to trial. The parties settled. But the amount of the settlement was $360,000. Now, here's a description of the case. This is believed to be the first successful nationwide UCC Article 9 class action settlement. The bank financed the consumer purchases of RVs, boats, and trailers. <laughs> if the consumers defaulted on the loan, the bank would exercise their rights under the UCC to repossess the collateral. After the repossession, the bank was required to send a notice to the consumer telling them when and where the post-repossession sale would occur. This requirement is identical among all the state's UCC provisions. All 50 states have adopted this. The notice which the bank sent out did not include any identification of where the sale would occur. The notice thus violated the UCC requirements of all 50 states. <clears throat> there was some disparity among the states of what the ramifications were for failing to provide proper notice, there are two basic categories of ramifications. In 44 states, there's a provision for the consumer to receive statutory damages in the amount of 10% of the amount financed plus all finance charges. In 48 states, there's also some form of a prohibition against seeking a deficiency balance uh, if they fail to do that. So 
48 states say that if you do it without sending the proper notification, you lose the right to go after the deficiency balance. So the question then is, of course, is whether this is an absolute bar or a presumption against the deficiency balance. The bank had sent the defective notice to about 1,100 consumers. Almost all these consumers had mandatory arbitration provisions in their contracts. Uh, However, the uh, arbitration provisions had a carve-out for repossession activities. Plaintiffs argued that this carve-out would exclude all aspects of repossession activities, including the post-repossession notices. The case was settled prior to this argument being decided by the court, but was a significant factor in the case being settled on a class basis. The bank also argued that the disparity in the various state laws made a class action untenable. Plaintiffs were able to show that the disparity was minimal and all substantive provisions were materially identical. And you have to understand, for a class action to work, you don't have to have identical claims for every member of the class. The point really usually comes down to what they call judicial economy. So you've got 100 people here who all say we've got similar complaints. And you listen to them and you go, well, they're similar, but they're not identical. Okay, if all 100 of them file lawsuits, is it easier for the court to go through them one at a time? Or could you put them together and resolve a lot of the issues in bulk? And quite often you can. So the most common one is where everyone gets wronged in the same way, but their damages are different. Courts have specifically said that differences in damage amounts between plaintiffs in a class is not a reason to not certify class. Class can be certified if that's the only difference. That's just one example. The class action settlement approved by the court included a common fund of $360,000. From this, the class reps received a $20,000 incentive award. Costs and fees were deducted, and the remaining balance was divided between all members in the statutory damages states who submitted a claim. This resulted in an award of approximately $1,100 per claimant. In addition, all class members in the deficiency balance states uh, received a credit of almost $600 against the balance and an agreement from the bank not to sue or seek arbitration on the remaining balance. So they got the money, but the balance got waived. So that's actually substantial. The bank had further assured that while this left the option for them to send out letters or make phone calls on the accounts, they have not routinely done so in the past and had no present intent to change that policy. Finally, the bank agreed to remove the entire trade line from the consumer's credit profile. So the repossession, gone from your credit records. Thus removing a derogatory credit reporting from these consumers' credit reports, this was a result which could not have been achieved in court without the settlement. So the plaintiff's attorney is who submitted this information to uh, the Lawyer's Weekly newspaper, uh, and that's out there. And so it does involve a bank called Merrick Bank, M-E-R-R-I-C-K, Merrick Bank, and it appears that the bulk of their lending is in the fields of boats, RVs, and trailers. And I laugh only because, uh, as an attorney who specializes in lemon law, I get calls all the time. People say, Steve, I bought a defective RV. I say, I don't handle those cases. They go, why not? I say, well, Michigan's lemon law does not cover RVs. Most, most states don't cover RVs with their lemon laws. Okay, I got a lemon boat. Boats aren't covered either. What? <laughs> yeah. So it turns out you buy a you know, little econo box uh, built in a third world country. I'm talking about a car for $25,000 and it's defective. You can make the manufacturer buy it back under the lemon law. It happens all day long. You can buy a quarter of a million dollar RV that won't run Lemon law doesn't cover it. Now, there are laws that do cover it, but the lack of lemon law coverage pushes it into a different category. And I don't handle those cases, and I don't actually know any attorneys in Michigan who do. So, unfortunately, that's the situation. That's why when I saw that that's what they financed, I'm like, oh, okay. It's one of the reasons I've never dealt with them before, I assume. So, Ross sent this to me. Thank you very much, my friend. Uh, And it's an interesting case uh, because here it's a class action settlement on behalf of a strange little portion of the UCC, but the the portion of the UCC there is there for a reason. And you should be allowed to follow the process of what's happening to you in this system. So when you borrowed the money and you got possession of the collateral and you defaulted and they repossessed the collateral, 
They can't just contact you a year from now and go, okay, you owe us $20,000. Why? What happened? You have the right to know. So they got to notify you of these things. It all comes in Uniform Commercial Code, Article 9, on secured transactions. Secured transactions. And what's funny is I remember in law school taking a class on the UCC. And I remember taking the class and, and, and talking about Article 9. And, of course, Article 2 is sales. You know, and you work your way through and we're at Article 9. And I remember at that time going, oh, my God. <laughs> my, my brain is starting to hurt. But it actually turns out to be a very, very interesting field of law. And it, interestingly, it's a field of law that does actually touch so many people. If you've ever bought something where the thing you bought was the collateral for the loan you got to buy the thing. <laughs> Purchase money, security interest, okay? And so if you've been through that transaction, it's good to know how it works. And so like I said, I, I did the one case of mine that went up on appeal, and I won that case on appeal. And uh, for about a week, <laughs> I was getting phone calls from around the country going, oh my gosh, explain Article 9 to me. I understand you're an expert. And I'm like, well, I got one case. What can I tell you? So there you go. Thanks, Ross. Questions or comments, put them below. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. All right, everyone. Line up alphabetically according to your height.